right, everybody. This is Evan from Free Range. I've got Joe Kent, uh, the one, the only, a brother from another mother sitting here from the great state of... Where are you from, Joe? <laughs> We're in Washington State. I know. So Washington State right now, and I've, I've talked about this for a while, Washington State is fucking loopy as hell. What the hell's going on out there, man? Well, I think like a lot of America, we uh, have a lot of good patriotic Americans that are in more rural communities or in smaller towns, but we're kind of being held hostage by one urban center that's ran by absolute lunatics who gets to pick our governor and a lot of our state legislation, unfortunately. Yeah, and and here's the great thing about Joe is he actually knows a few things about the country. Uh, he knows a few things based on his individual service, uh, the sacrifice both his family is made for this country and he cares about it. Not only does he care about it, but he loves America. Um, so give us a bit of your background for the people that don't know who Joe is like, just give us your, your, uh, your the, as long as you want to take on your bio, man, like tell us, tell us all about it. Wait. Hey, so from right here in the Pacific Northwest, um, far back as I can remember, I think like a lot of people listening to this podcast, um, wanted to join the military and go forth and serve the country. So this is pre-9-11, um, but I was really inspired by the 1993 Black Hawk Down incident that kind of put me on my my career path to want to be an Army Ranger and in special operations. So I turned 18 and went off and got to go do just that. Started out in Ranger Battalion and then went to Special Forces. Was in the SF, the Special Forces Qualifications course when 9-11 happened. So we got to go kind of right into the the game of war right away. Um, did Went to fit Special Forces group, so primarily focused in on Iraq, Yemen, and kind of the central of the Middle East uh, for most of my career. I uh, did that for quite a while, uh, finished out a 20-year career, retired on a Friday, and then sworn at the CIA on a uh, on a Monday as a paramilitary and operations officer. Intended to keep that as my um, as my second career um, for the rest of kind of like my adult life. But then about two years ago, my world kind of got turned upside down. My late wife, Shannon Kent, who was also in special operations, was killed. Uh, fighting ISIS in Syria. So she was killed about a month after President Trump tried to get our troops out of Syria the first time. So it kind of put me on the trajectory I'm on right now. So despite all the grief I was going through, I wanted to start speaking out on foreign policy because I felt that President Trump got our foreign policy right. He set a clear military objective to go out and crush the territorial caliphate, all the ground that ISIS held, and then tried to get us out. Um, and had President Trump actually been able to get our troops out like he ordered, my wife and the others that were killed there that day with her would still be alive. So I started speaking out in support of President Trump's foreign policy, um, worked a little bit on the Trump campaign, had uh, an invitation to go back and work in the second Trump administration um, in the foreign policy side. And then just seeing the direction that our country is heading after, especially after the 2020 election, where there was widespread discrepancies, potential fraud. Uh, I think right now we're seeing evidence of fraud. And then the way that the left just took full control with media, social media, and all that to really start targeting average Americans for dissenting from what they say. I wanted to start speaking out and doing something, you know, more involved in local government. Um, and then my congresswoman, who I voted for, who's supposed to be a Republican, voted for the impeachment of President Trump, and then went along with this whole narrative that says that pretty much anybody who thinks there was discrepancies in the last election or is a conservative is a potentially a white nationalist or some kind of a terrorist that we need to go and, and look at and potentially even target. So I, didn't, I never wanted to go into politics, but I felt compelled to do so because I just don't like the direction that our country's heading in. And I have two young sons who lost their mother when they were very young. And soon I'm going to have to look them in the eyes and tell them that this is the country that their mother gave her life for. And so I can't do that right now in the state that we're in. So I want to go go to Congress and attempt to clean a lot of that up. Well, there's a lot to start here, which is first and foremost, uh, you know, you and I have been talking for the last couple of years off and on. Uh, we know a lot of the same people. Scotty Wirtz was a friend of mine. Uh, he was there, I believe, with Shannon at the same time. Yeah. Um, you know, as a guy that worked with the agency for nine years, the world's pretty small. Um, and, you know, words can't convey uh, the amount of sorrow that I can feel for you and your family uh, over the last several years that, or the last couple of years that we've been talking um, it's very emotionally contextual for me because we share a very similar background. Um, I've worked in those exact places. I think you and I have cut probably a lot of the same ground and I have two little kids. And uh, so I, I, I have so much respect for what you've done and so much that you're willing to do because the sacrifices you have to make and have made for this country. If there's anybody that can speak from, uh, I think, 
higher ethical ground. It's uh, Joe Kent as far as what he is, uh, what you're saying is what's happening in the country, what's happened in foreign policy. And if whether or not you agree with him, I still think uh, Joe warrants your respect to uh, listen, right? So he might he might know a few things that he's talking about, which so first and foremost, I, I, I you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword when people thank other people for their service. Um, because, you know, you know, as well as I do, like 90% of those things, they, they do come from a heartfelt place, but it's yeah. also, it generates inertia for some of the other false thank yous. Right. So, but right. dude, I know how much you've given to this country and I, I can't thank you enough for everything that you've, you've had to do personally and what your, what your family has done is, is absolutely incredible. Um, so let's go back and let's talk, um, foreign policy. So let's just talk foreign policy for a couple minutes. minutes, yeah. um, which you and I have both spent a lot of time in the middle East and, uh, you know, I have my personal feelings, but, you know, give me that, the, the, the Joe Kent once over the world as to the failure of previous administrations that kind of led us. So I actually, that's a leading question. <laughs> I won't. I won't even. I won't even say what I what I think. I'll just say, hey man, what what do you think we've done right? What do you think we've done wrong in the last uh, twenty years of your career? What have you seen? And honestly, I, I know it's a hard question, so yeah. do the best to to summarize that. Yeah, um, I, I'm sure I can point at a couple of things that we did right, like on the tactical level, but as far as strategic big picture, like what we're doing over there. I think it's just a really, it's, it's a good case study. And it's, I hope it's a lesson that we learn as opposed to continue to double and triple down on the same failures. Um, we After 9-11, we went to war, I think, for all the right reasons. I mean, Al-Qaeda from Afghanistan, they were able to attack America and inflict a unbelievable amount of damage on this country. Um, and so we had to go over there and we had to go take those guys out. And so the, the, our initial push into Afghanistan was done for all the right reasons. Shortly thereafter, though, once we took out the Taliban guys that supported Al Qaeda and we started really going after some of the, the serious Al Qaeda operatives, we really hit a hard, um, a hard pause and made a conscientious decision at the, at the policymaker level without the consent of the American people. So the American people gave, uh, our military and our leadership the permission to go over and seek out vengeance for 9-11 and then also to make sure that another 9-11 couldn't happen. The American people didn't sign the check for continued regime change wars or to go about nation building. But sometime around, I don't know, I think spring of 2002, um, when bin Laden and Zawahiri and some of the hardcore members of al-Qaeda escaped into Pakistan, who we provide foreign aid to, we decided to stop and not pursue them into Pakistan, but to start nation building in Afghanistan. And George Bush gave a whole speech about it, about how he changed his mind. He had this great neoconservative idea that we could go and we could build a democracy in a place like Afghanistan that quickly morphed because they had already begun the lead up to the to justifying invasion of Iraq and the lofty intelligence that we know has all been debunked at this point of WMD, Saddam supporting Al Qaeda. That led to this whole other chapter that pretty much led to the, the current unraveling we're seeing in the in the Middle East. So the big lesson for me, what we, we've gotten wrong is that we didn't, we, we went to war for a clearly stated national security issue. We had to go take out bin Laden, we had to go take out Al Qaeda. But then after that, we quickly diverted into a mission that was really just an idea that didn't have an actual clearly defined A, national security interest, but B, an end state. Like, how does this thing actually end? Um, and then really for me, a, a big lesson too, and I think this is a lesson that any real leader has to learn the hard way, um, or you kind of stop being a leader. Uh, the exception is when you're in government. If you continue to do things that fail, government's like the only place that you can actually like keep your job. Right. I mean, the, we, we have not been successful once at building any of these governments in Afghanistan, Iraq. There's even this little, you know, part of Syria we're trying to get into and prop up, you know, X, you know, group X, Y, and Z. And it just hasn't worked. There's no data to support this continued hypothesis that we can go and build nations in our image by force, and in, in particular in the Middle East. So, I mean, that's just, I guess, the, the, big, the big picture view of all the many things that we got wrong. Yeah, and it's interesting because you and I have uh, very similar views, and we've, we've actually never spent any time talking about this. So we have, very exper- we have, we have varying experiences in the same places working very similar uh, jobs. 
and we have a we have a very similar look as to what's happened. Uh, the, you know, I, I looked at Afghanistan when I was over there, and I, I thought about the the amount of logistics and capital, uh, the blood and the treasure ultimately that we are sacrificing in Afghanistan. I kept thinking about how you know a, a smaller footprint, uh, higher advisor. Uh, advisor to indigenous personnel ratio that we should have been running over there. Uh, minimum success criteria as far as like, what are we looking for? So what does it mean to actually be mission accomplished? You can't just like throw out the terms mission accomplished without defining what the objective is, what your minimum success criteria is. And then what is our success criteria for withdrawal? I don't think you can actually enter a war without defining those things. I don't think it's acceptable for the taxpayer to continue to write the fucking checks either. Right, exactly. Yeah, write the checks and, and fill up the body bags. And, and again, it goes back to like, hey, what what are we doing in Afghanistan or Iraq? What, what do we need from these places? Because we always go off on these long tangents about like, well, we have to build the government and then we can't, if we leave, and you're hearing this debate right now with Afghanistan, you're seeing right. the whole national security element saying like, oh my God, guys, if we leave, the Afghan government, like they're just going to collapse. And it's like, well, yeah, it's kind of like there never was an Afghan government in the first place. So it, it's like, well, what do we actually need from there? There was very little like reverse planning done a long time ago. We got away from like, what's the end state? What's the actual mission? But to make sure terrorists can't gain a safe harbor here, then there's, then what do you need a ministry of interior functioning in, in, the, in Afghanistan for? Like, Hey, if they, if they build it on their own, sure. Right. That's great. But if they don't, does that really matter to the Americans, to, to American, you know, the, our country and our taxpayers? Yeah, and, and it's interesting because I remember very specifically, it was a, to deny sanctuary, right? It was like to deny yeah. sanctuary from any terrorist element that seeks to uh, destroy America or something like that. I forget exactly the strategic yeah. terminology. Um, but that seemed to be... Uh, I, I think thrown out the window when we decided to help write a constitution that involved Islamic Security. Republic. And so when yeah. you put those words into a constitution and or the functioning element of a government, you have clearly failed to separate church and state. And I don't know how as a government entity, as a, as a, as a state department bureaucrat, you can't look at that and say, we have failed from the jump. Yeah. We have failed from the jump. Uh, and how is it that, you know, I, I don't know, you, I, I don't know, I don't expect you to necessarily answer this, but how is it that the clear lack of journalistic integrity over the last 20 years, people holding people accountable in positions, right. because you're right, there's no other functioning element, functioning, definable as right, functioning, functioning. Uh, that can continue to fail over and over, and they'll never be held accountable. Like there's no accountability whatsoever, unless you're like a, a, a you know national security expert, you know, <laughs> part part of that group. Then it's like you can just go and opine about counterinsurgency and building governments and all that type of stuff. And and you know when you ask for actual data where it's worked, maybe they throw something out. But especially if you're talking about the Middle East, they just say, well, no, we just need one more year. You know, we just need one more big surge, and we never really took it seriously, guys. So we're going to try really hard this time. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's just this recipe for perpetual war and and you're right i mean that there's been a handful of journalists that have attempted to cover it but i mean if, if you need any, any any evidence that the media establishment really likes war it's right there there's just yeah. been so many different holes and the reasons why we went to war how much we've wasted how little we've been able to define what the mission is what the end state is but the media you see them doing far more fluff pieces than the new york times and the washington post about like concerns over U.S. With US withdrawal in Afghanistan, you know, like these, what, what they're portraying to be these deeply thoughtful and intellectual pieces written about like how the whole world's going to end if we pull out of Afghanistan or we pull out of Iraq, when, when really I would, I would appreciate it much more if they were doing things like really covering, I mean, they released the Afghan papers, but about, what about a yeah. year ago, they exposed all the different lies. And that was, that was hot in the news. And I was glad it was in the news, but it, it, I mean, it had like a week maybe where people were mad about it, but then we're right back to like, what's going to happen to the little girls in schools in Afghanistan when we pull out, maybe we should just stay. Well, and all that is, is that's, a, that's a, uh, a military industrial complex talking point that allows them to continue to put us into a state of perpetual war, right? It's what about the girls? 
Hey man, you've had 20 years to figure this out. Like we, we got right. we have bigger fucking fish to fry. It's called China. Yeah. It's called Russia. It's called oh, real yeah. strategic enemies that can actually deteriorate what it, what we call a country. But the Taliban right. can't mount a, a overall insurgency on the shores of America. That's fucking, that, that's infuriatingly stupid to even think about. I yeah. Think, from my perspective, uh, now I'm not saying that counterterrorism is not, directly aligned with what we should be accomplishing strategically, I yeah. think that there is a, musk, a much uh, less costly in both uh, American sacrifices of your service members and taxpayer dollars. I think there's a wit, much more efficient way to run the, the, we'll call it a special operations and airborne war in Afghanistan to deny terrorist sanctuary. But I, I could not agree. I just don't agree we should be in the business of fucking nation building. I just don't think that we're I, I just don't no. think that we are. I don't know. Do you think that there's a reason for that from your perspective? No, no, it's just, it's just never worked. I mean, I, I wish, and I, I've said this before, I, I wish as a guy, I'm, I'm sure you feel the same way as a guy who spent like my, most of my adult life over there. I wish I could come and say, hey, we went through some really hard fighting over there, but we did build these awesome governments. And now like you can take a, a flight to Iraq and now we have this great trading partner that's there. It's very strategic. Right. I mean, I wish I could say that, but like, Living in the real world, like we, you just can't say that it's, it just hasn't worked. So I think there, there comes a time when you have to like get rid of most really good lofty ideas and just say, Hey, they haven't worked and, and be very realistic. And if it's like, do we just need to have the ability to hunt and kill terrorists? Like, okay. Well, the one good thing about the global war on terror is that we actually did get pretty good at that. Yeah. You know, and we can do it with a pretty low footprint. So like, what are we talking about here? Especially if you look at the, the threats that have emanated against the homeland since the, the war on terror began. A lot of them were from countries that we weren't necessarily at war with, but we were still able to go and, and take those guys out. Like Yemen's a good example. Pakistan, I don't like how much foreign aid we give those guys, right. but we still were able to track down bin Laden over there. I mean, yeah, you can make the argument that our helicopters didn't have to fly as far to go kill the guy because we were in Afghanistan, but that hardly justifies two decades of war. I mean, I'm sure we could find another place to launch helicopters from, you know? So, I, yeah, I, counterterrorism, I think we can continue to do through, you know, Title 50 intelligence uh, activities, covert action. Um, but this whole nation building thing, it's just, it just hasn't worked. Sorry, guys. Yeah. yeah. And I had this debate. I remember having this debate internally, even when we were, we were there, right? I remember uh, I was there, uh, SOFA. So it was like January, 2009 yeah. in Iraq. Yeah. I was in Basra and we were having this debate as to what have we accomplished since 2003? And I was on the invasion and then I, 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 I was there on the sofa. So, and I was there for 280 plus days a year, every year in between. So I had a really good contextual relationship with the country. Uh, and really, man, it was so difficult for me to define what we had accomplished in those six years. And I remember trying to, to, um, I remember trying to validate it. Like, like this is, this has been my time. And it's like, it's a fucking really, really hard thing to do introspectively when you start looking at what we've been able to do, what we could have done better. And granted, it's always easy to be like, Oh, looking back, we should have done all that stuff, you know, armchair quarterback. But I couldn't agree more when we're really good at putting bullets in terrorists. Like we're really good at finding those guys and, uh, you know, taking them to task. And the guys that do that every day around the world, like the intelligence officers and the special operations guys, the guys that do that and the infantry, the, all the combat arms, you guys are like all the respect in the world because we're really fucking good at that. I think what we're really bad at is holding uh, administrations uh, and we'll call it uh, the, the political elite accountable for minimum success criteria because without that, you just have infinite war, right? This is this is the buzzword. It just keeps going on and on and on. You always have an excuse because it's about uh, it becomes about these esoteric realities that ultimately will it'll take generations to change. If you think about yeah. like the uh, increasing the higher education capabilities of uh, female youth in Afghanistan, that is a cultural generational issue that will take us decades to remedy. It's not something that we're going to be yeah. like. We're, we spent $10 billion this year. It looks like next year we're all good to go, man. We got this shit right. taken yeah. care of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, really, like, it, it, it sounds cold-hearted to say, but, like, does it matter? Like, even if, 
it'd be great if every country would look like America and act like America. But like, if they don't, if Afghanistan wants to be an Islamic Republic, I mean, it's, it's kind of debatable whether or not they're a Republic, but if they want to send little girls to school, like I feel, I, I feel sorry for the little girls that have to live there. But does that mean that we need to spend billions of dollars? Does that mean, mean we need to put American lives in risk at, at harm, like I, in harm's way? I just don't think that that's what we need to be using our national security apparatus for. So my, Whenever people say things like that, you know, that, hey, we do have to be over there because we, have, we now have a commitment to this group or there's an atrocities are going to happen. My response to that is, like, OK, fine. If that's our new criteria for using force, then you need to go make the case to the American people that we need to start the draft. And I mean the draft for everybody, men, yeah. women, you know, probably starting at age 18 and going all the way out to people are in their 40s. Because you know what? The world outside of the, the shores of America is like pretty dangerous and yes. bad. And there's a lot of bad people doing bad things to other people. So if we're going to go save the world, then go sell it to the American people because we are, we will be at war all the time everywhere. Oh, I couldn't agree. I, I, I've talked about that and it's, and it's interesting because you bring up conscription. Now, this is a fantastic point, which is I've said the same thing. If you're going to continue to take the moral high ground internationally and do these regime change, country building exercises with Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, uh, Halliburton, everybody else. Just initiate the draft. And then all of a sudden, Americans will start paying attention to what the fuck is going on overseas because they're like, I don't want my kids to go over and fight in some crazy ass war where it's never going to end. Like they, they would never have the stomach or the tolerance no. for it. But no. instead... They can perpetuate the cycle and continue to, I think, uh, recruit patriotic Americans to right. put them in the chute and use this excuse. As a, it's a volunteer army. You know, you right. volunteer. Uh, yeah, but that, that, that just means that you're signing up. And I think that at 18, 20, whatever age you are, and you decide to serve your country, then it's a fantastic decision. I'll support that 110%. <laughs> But that doesn't give us the excuse to go and do whatever the fuck we want to do internationally because we're using a volunteer force. It doesn't give us strategic international uh, efficacy, both in the reality of the tactical situation on the ground, and two, it doesn't give us moral high ground because we're a volunteer force. Like, it just doesn't. Um, right. So constant... If we don't have leaders... <laughs> What's yeah, that? Yeah. No, if we, if we don't have leaders that understand how valuable the all-volunteer force is, that we have a whole professional warrior class that's willing to go fight, bleed, die all over the world at any given time, if we don't have leaders that realize how precious that is and how valuable that is, then we don't deserve to actually have that. That's that's my opinion. Like, there's no... It's just a recipe for perpetual war because if our elected officials aren't held accountable by the people because the people never feel the cost of war then it's almost like we were not worthy of having this all volunteer force. I mean, when I was in the military, I think if you would ask me, do you want draftees? I think I would have said, hell no. Like right. I only want, especially coming from special operations, like I don't even want to be around, you know, regular army guys, not knocking them or anything, but I wanted to be around, I wanted to be around all volunteers. You know, I want to be around right. guys who were like fighting for the opportunity to be there. But now I, now that I'm out and, and uh, I can kind of be more reflective, I really think it'd be a good thing if we did have some draftees in there. And something like a college degree didn't exempt you or being enrolled in college didn't exempt you. I think it'd be a good thing if every now and again, you know, the lobbyist from Raytheon or, you know, the some rich family, they started getting some kids at Harvard started getting draft notices in the mail that says, hey, if we're going to war, like you're coming with us because you guys are actually the check. Yeah. You're the real check on a perpetual conflict. And I just think that would make it so much more real for the American people. It, it would provide... A, a very uh, visceral emotional reaction to people in places of power. If the government truly did what it was supposed to do with this and there wasn't college deferment because that, that was just a loophole where mm -hmm. you, you could get your, you know, rich kids could basically get out of the draft and they could harvest the poor for, yep. you know, an, an infinite war in Southeast Asia. Um, and I think if, you know, the, the, the bankers, private equity, the, you know, chief executive officers and the political elite started getting draft notices for their children in the mail. People would take a vested interest in what was happening overseas. They really would. They would wake the fuck up and go, oh, you know what? Maybe we should do some um, auditing. And you know what? The Pentagon mm -hmm. papers, the Pentagon papers might last longer than a week, <laughs> right? Right. They might last exactly. longer than a week. 
Yeah, and, and you have, like, I mean, Congress is supposed to be a big check on that as well. I mean, with the president gets a lot of the blame because the buck stops with them, but Congress is supposed to be the ones that are controlling the purse strings. They also have power to declare war. And since 9-11, we've been operating on the same set of authorities. So I think if people were getting those draft notices in the mail in Congress, the positions I'm running for, we have to run every two years. You right. would see people being way more involved than like, hey, Congressman X, regardless of party, what did you just vote for? Are you voting for this thing, this National Defense Authorization Act? Hey, why is there... I think everybody would know what authorization use of military force is at that point if they were getting the draft notices in the mail. And we would actually have like a, a national dialogue like you and I are having right now. Like, hey, wait, do we want to send a wave of draftees over to drive little schools to this all girls school? Like, right. so is that what we're doing here? Like, I, I just think it would be a much more realistic conversation. You, you know, and it's interesting because from our subculture, what we're talking about is not. Is, is 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 not normal. At least it wasn't six years ago when I was there. People yeah. would be like, what the fuck crack are you smoking? You want conscription? <laughs> yeah. Fuck you. You're an idiot. Like they, they would yeah, literally exactly. say you're an idiot. And right. there would be an ongoing debate. If we were, if we we're having this conversation in a team room somewhere, guys would be like chomping at the bit to jump down our fucking throats. <laughs> they would be like, no fucking way. You know what I, I mean? Six or seven years ago, I might have been, I might have been the guy being like, you're a fucking <laughs> idiot. No way, dude. Like, don't, get that trash out of here. And like, yeah. Six or seven years ago, you and I would have been probably on the same team going, you guys are stupid. There's no way we should do that. Seven years, like, now I've got some clarity, right? I've got a little bit of clarity yeah. and perspective. I'm a civilian, right? So you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned. Yeah, you know, I, I was, I was primarily concerned with my, uh, you know, my team, my, my, my unit, what I was doing professionally, yeah. that, that was my, that was my concern, right? Now, you know, two little kids and a business and I'm integrated into the community. I'm way more involved, I think, in thinking about how we as civilians make a direct impact based on our experience. How do we make uh, a substantive impact based on our experience? Yeah. And there's a lot of things going on here because what I see is that there's an active campaign to devalue our experience, to bucket us into a group of fucking wingnuts mm -hmm. because we're counter the narrative. You know, I, I like to think it's like, you know, pulling out of Afghanistan or, or Syria or Iraq, that was a D and C talking point if they remember when the Bush administration was in office. It yeah. just became a fucking uh, a counter narrative because there was a different administration in town. Oh, well, we got to, we got to, you know, really be proactive in this. But now I see there's, especially on social media, there is a, I think there's an organized attempt by at least one side of the media to devalue our experience to say, you guys don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And right. I think when they bucket people into extremists, I, you saw it from the DNC or uh, the, the former, um, yeah, the yeah former DNC. I think it was Brennan. He said that libertarians. Yep. He bucketed libertarians. He did into a group of extremists. And I, I was sitting there watching this. I was like, this guy ran the DNC, and he's talking about a legitimate political party as a group of fucking crazies. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Socialism and communism is a greater, much greater threat than any of these fucking guys think that libertarianism less government. No, less government affects the government. Like, that's why people don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty alarming, too, because that Brennan, former director of uh, CIA, and he was one of Obama's national security advisors. That guy says, like, libertarians are, are a massive threat and Trump supporters are a massive threat. But that dude had no issues with signing the death warrants of American citizens with no due process whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, I think some of those guys had it coming because they were terrorists doing terrorist things that made themselves combatants. But he made that moral leap, like, and then almost in the same sentence, he's like, you know who else I don't like? The guys in the other political party. Like, yeah. wait, wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> stop. What? Did you just hear what you had to say? And they, they do. And I think you're right, though. There is an effort right now by a lot of folks on the left and in the mainstream media to say, to, to now sound like neoconservatives, or I guess neoliberals would be the right way to, to kind of characterize them. But they say that we're the crazy ones yeah. that want to get out of these wars, that, that want to discredit veterans that are speaking out and saying, like, hey, guys, we... We really haven't achieved anything here in all this. And they, they like to do the whole thank you for your service. But then they also like to say, hey, we're squandering the sacrifices of all those. If we pull out now, you heard that with the whole Russian bounties narrative, which which has now been completely debunked.
bomb bomb there was no Russian bounties. And, and they admit it. They're like, oh, yeah, we lied about that. Yeah. You know, but at the time, they're like, we can't leave Afghanistan because someone's paying to have American soldiers killed. And I was like, this logic makes no sense whatsoever. I'm like, whether, the, whether there is Russian bounties, there isn't Russian bounties. That, that premise, I, re- I, I think that that's absolute insanity. We can't leave because people are killing us. Like, that's, that's a good reason to leave. If we're bleeding and there's no gain, why wouldn't we leave? So, yeah, I, I think there's a huge effort because I think they realize how dangerous people like us are that actually have a resume and a background in this that, get, that are not afraid to speak out and then go counter to staying at war forever because there's so many different financial incentives and then political incentives. Like, I think there's a lot of people on the left and even on the right that hate the fact that an outsider like Trump came in and said, hey, these wars are really dumb. And I think we should get out of them. And there's a lot of people that are like, oh, I wanted to say that like 10 years ago, but then I supported the surge and I'm kind of I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like all in this right now. Yeah, and I can't yeah. I can't go against it. I hate it that that guy got it right. Just human nature. Well, and that's the interesting thing that I saw over the course of the administration, which was it, it was irrelevant to the position. It didn't matter. Like it didn't matter what position. There was just a counter sway. To yeah. whatever whatever he said, we have to do the opposite, and it's it, it's so interesting to see that take place in mainstream media and how there's this really distinct difference between the way you know NYT or some of these other organizations uh, uh, they they press a president on specific issues or they don't like that stupid story they did on Biden and how he like puts a log on the fire in the morning. I'm like, nobody got a puff piece. No, no, no Republican administration ever got a fucking puff piece about putting a log on the fire in the fuck. Like you guys are so disgusting. And it's like, I look at it from gaslighting from this perspective of, and I think the left and the right both gaslight by the way. So I'm not excluding the, the, the right either, but have you seen it? And, and, and I think it's time we, we shift into, you know, more of a localized uh, election cycle for you or, or what your experience. Have you seen that locally? Is it local newspapers, places in Washington state, like the direct manipulation of information? Have you seen that during your campaign? And obviously you can talk about it whenever you've seen it. Uh, but are you experiencing yeah. any of that? Yeah, I mean, definitely. There's uh, if, if the local... I'd say main, the local mainstream media that go to cover the race, they really want to focus on, you know, hey, I'm I'm a crazy Trump supporter, right? Um, and I and I believe that like the election was stolen, and you know, I'm against COVID lockdowns because they've made COVID this new religion of like, are you obedient enough to the government? And if you're obedient, you're a good person. If you're not obedient, you're a bad person. So you know, they they show up to an event and they cover it and they say like, no one was wearing masks, and you know, just hyper very hyperbolic stuff like that. And then you know. They have this whole characterization, I think, of of what a Trump supporter is supposed to be. And I have a lot of economic issues that are kind of a departure from traditional Republican free market type of values that are more populist along with what what Trump was preaching, but also a lot of what kind of Bernie Sanders was preaching of making the government actually work for people. I think that's huge, especially the way our industries have been gutted. But they never want to talk about that. They usually want to talk about, you know, the election until I talk about like actual hard data from the election, then they don't want to talk about that. They wanna they wanna shift the conversation back into something crazy that someone else said in the tweet or something like that. So there's, there's a ton of gaslighting that goes on. I, I think it's just something that comes part and parcel to being a, a conservative or just really not even a conservative, really just bucking the narrative. Cause especially yeah. I think in this last year, especially on the, the COVID issue, we've seen a lot of people who I think may have defined themselves as either not politically active or even on the left that have come out and really pushed back on a lot of the COVID and watching the media turn on them to say that there's some sort of conspiracy theorist for saying like, hey, hydroxychloroquine might have actually worked. Or, you know, like maybe the disease actually came from a bioweapons lab in China. And all, all this stuff that's coming to light now, but to see the way that was weaponized against people who really just dissented from the narrative, I think that that's just very telling of, of how dangerous the media has become and big, big tech too, especially. Yeah, in the... There used to be a time when uh, civil dissidence was socially acceptable within yeah. the DNC. Like there was, and there is times, right, when it's a like, when it feeds into their narrative uh, on both on both sides. And I like to tell, I, I, from my perspective, you know, uh, I, I I like to talk about people in the context of like less government is a good thing, right? Like that's the big thing that my my premise and stuff of this is like, man, less government is a good thing, you know. 
the big machine, if people had, because I think they look at the government, obviously the human brain is only capable of, of, of intellectualizing a very, very small fraction of how big the machine is. Yeah. Um, I think you have to feel the machine from the inside to truly understand how big it is. Yeah. And then from there you could say, okay, but all the touch points of government, uh, you know, whether it's taxation or government, program, whatever it might be, you know, these are all things that require people and, and interference within the American way of life. And it, it's, it's so interesting to me that we've been able to see this in our lifetime because I didn't think we didn't see it as much in the Obama administration. So we went from like, you know, Bush to Obama. And I think from those two administrations, we didn't really see this big swing of adjustment between, you know, Republicans and Democrats. Right. I think what Trump did is he brought to light, there's a big difference. <laughs> like, I, I think, yeah. I think actually he brought to light that there's a small difference within the political establishment and there's a big yes. difference between people and what they think about as far as like conservative values and progressive values. Um, yep. And I think, you know, from my perspective, I don't know how we can justify allowing, I, I guess, communism to have a information uh, foothold in America and allowing that to not be unfiltered and allowing that to just go anywhere and everywhere it wants to go. Because I look at that as like, it is a cancer, right? It affects yeah. a country and a society. And what it does is it, it deteriorates it from within and it will rot the core of any country. And but that's free. Like you can, you can propagate that anywhere you want, man. You can throw that information anywhere you want. And I was thinking about this. I want to get your response to it. Uh, I think about it in context of, you know, the Soviets went to work on us like a hundred years ago, right? I mean, they, they went to work wow. right after the Bolshevik revolution. Yeah. Um, in their information war, understanding that they could put out a, a variance of information that allowed people to kind of stick their toe in socialism. But eventually the goal is to have full co-opted buy-in into full-blown, we'll call it Soviet-style communism. And I think China's got a different form of it, but ultimately it's still kind of the same concept. And they, and it's proven when they went to work uh, trying to co-opt the, ent the entire uh, we'll call it the education elite by buying into this theory or this uh, political philosophy. Uh, they affected Oxford. They infected Oxford and that uh, lighthouse for, I would say, the Western civilization's elite education. And they knew if they dropped Oxford, that Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, yeah. everybody else would fall. And if they get those, everybody falls in line behind that. I think they missed on their timeline. I think uh, I think they missed on their timeline, but I think we're still feeling the effects of the information cold war that we were in for decades. Uh, do you think there's any legitimacy to my my thought process on that, or am I just fucking out to lunch? No, I, mean, I think you can actually. I mean, I think you prove most of that pretty easily. I, I think what the left did was they infiltrated our institutions, starting with education, but then the, their their march through the media, I think, has been really remarkable too. So if you take education, you take media, you basically take the two main sense-making organs that like our society is supposed to have. Like education teaches you how to family your parents do, but education teaches you how to think. And then especially if you're, if you're one of the ones that's, that's um, well off enough to go to university and you're supposed to become sort of a leader in this country, because that's kind of how the university system was initially designed. You, you get another he healthy set of indoctrination there. And then the media that's supposed to filter everything like we we're just talking about. I mean, the media is the media being complicit with these wars has kept us in, you know, war now for two decades, not to mention all the other damage that's been done to the country. Now, so I, I, I think you're spot on. I think there was I think it didn't happen as fast as they may have intended because of like World War Two that really kind of set the, the Soviets, the Russians back a little bit. Yeah. But then also we here in America, we had this huge collective struggle that the whole country went through like pretty much every man went and fought or supported the fight you know they not, weren't all charged in the beaches in normandy but they all did something yeah. and then the women that were back here they all participated in the industry there was a massive amount of sacrifice then they came back all that in industry for the war was then repurposed to build the country back so i think the greatest generation they totally deserve that title 
because they kind of they gave this pause to all the the assault from the institutions and then they built their own institutions that because they had so much skin in the game from the war whatever role they played they cared deeply about the country um and i think they were a little bit tired and and so maybe they they didn't impart those they didn't um articulate those values as much to to their parents uh, or to their kids our parents um because then we all know what happened with the boomers and, and then the vietnam war too i think the way that that scarred the trust that we had placed in our government that the trust that was built up after world war ii the way that, that scarred it i i think we're still feeling the effects of that because that really let the leftists in the institutions come in and say see i told you this american system it's horrible man like look what it's doing and they're like oh my god the vietnam war was absolute garbage like we had a draft all these kids died for, and for what so you know, I, I do. I do think there's a lot of validity to that, and I, and I think the way that um, our our political establishment kind of developed into these two different camps and kind of like different only on a couple key issues, but really had a lot of the same results. I think that built the resentment that led to a guy like Trump coming in and punching through all of it. And now you're seeing the media, the media, and then I would say educated society and the elites that are in they're in a panic over Trump, and it's not just Trump the guy. It's the fact that there's 75 to 80 million people in America, in this country, and their families who identify with that, that know that the system is rigged, and we're, and we're really starting to get aw- awakened to that. I think that really has them in panic. I think, I think it's, uh, it, it's strange. I think all, ultimately, it's, it, I don't know what the long-term objective is to you know, tell you know, 75, 80 million Americans that they're now labeled as extremists. And it's it, it, okay. Uh, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, it, I'm like, okay, so you're going to take, you're going to take, you know, Trump off all of uh, social media platforms. You're going to label an entire, you know, 80 million people as extremists. And I look at people like my dad and, and like a bunch of these other people. And it's like, man, I'm, I'm not an extremist. My dad's not an extremist. Nobody's an extremist. We just want to be left the fuck alone. Like, I just want to be left alone, man. Like you do you, yeah. like, I don't care. Like you can do yeah. you. I, I want, I'm a proponent of freedom. That's what I want. I want people to be free to kind of live their fullest American life. Right. So regardless of where they come from, their gender, their skin color, whatever it is, like, I just want them to go out and do them. Like, it's awesome. It's a, it's a free country. Amazing. Or at what, you know, at one point. Right. So, uh, I think it's, I don't know what the long term. Have you have you tried to think about the long term strategy as, as far as like that narrative and what what is it? Like, yeah, I mean, this is. Did you know we have awesome free range American T shirts? Wait, what am I wearing? I can't even get this shirt. Cut. Just head on over to freerangeamerican.us and click the shop button. Get yours today. Where I, or, I mean, I, I truly believe that what's at play right now in our country is an effort to crash our entire system. I mean, I think China has done a really good job of posturing them, their, themselves economically and then also culturally because they've been right. able to infiltrate some of the, a lot of our institutions as well, too. But I'm not saying that, you know, uh, whatever, Joe Biden's like a Manchurian candidate or whatever. I'm not saying that. But I think that this ideology has crept so deep into the left that they are willing, once they get control of the reins of power like they have, to drive it uh, towards their agenda as fast and as hard as they can, even eroding a lot of the checks and balances that should exist. Like, we're supposed to have a fairly inefficient federal government. Sure. That's like one of the big checks, checks and balances to make sure that whoever's in power can't be like, ha it's my turn, now you yeah. all do what I say. That's not the way our system works. Not supposed to be anyways. Right. But the way the Biden administration has been moving since they took power, that's very much been the message. And Again, like they're not taking actions that are in the best interest. It's not like, hey, we just have a different point of view. Because I think like a very establishment Republican and a very establishment Democrat, they're similar in the sense that they kind of want the same thing at the end of the day. They want a better life for their kids. They want to stay a safe country. But now it's not even that. The way that Joe Biden is killing off all these jobs, running up our national debt, continuing our foreign engagements, killing off our energy independence. Like, how can anyone look at how can anyone with a straight face say that like, well, you know, he probably has the best interest of the country at heart, especially when you have a predatory country like China that stands to gain so much from, from our decline. And 
you have an elite class that is actually gaining as we all decline, the corporate donors, the, the tech oligarchs, all those guys. Like, so I, I do think there's something much more, you know, unfortunately nefarious like at play right now. I think a lot of the middle mid-level actors that are helping him pursue his agenda, I think a lot of them are, they do believe in some of the more lofty social goals of like, hey, this is just all about equality. We're trying to right the wrongs from the past because they've been so indoctrinated by the leftists and the Marxists that are part of the education system and the media. And the media, of course, is continuing to not do its job whatsoever right? Um, and covering any of this. But yeah, I, I, I think that there's a serious effort right now by the far left and, and by Joe Biden to, to really drive this country off a cliff. Like if crashing the economy, I think is going to be key to that, unfortunately, so they can have some sort of a reset with that, that puts in universal basic income, like right. socialist um, and economic system. And then look what they're doing to the military, man. I mean, like, they're doing all these loyalty tests because that's the next thing you need to do. You need to get total control of the military. They're trying to turn the military essentially into a Praetorian Guard where every senior officer or mid-level officer has to essentially take an oath, not to the Constitution, but to the new political party. And you do, and you do that by bowing down to, like, the altar of woke ideology or you get fired. Yeah. Have you heard a lot from uh, guys in the military right now, like, exactly yeah. what's happening like, what is it that's happening? Like, yeah. like in that yeah. loyalty test, do you have any insight into that? So I've heard a bunch of like anecdotes that are hard to like independently verify because you're not there in the room. Right. So people will talk. And, I, and I've seen some people that have actually taken pictures of the unclassified um, extremist stand down stuff that pretty much does classify a lot of conservatives or like, you know, conservative symbols like the don't tread on me, the Gadsden flag, you know, stuff like that. It's like, OK, come on, man. You know, I don't care if somebody has a freaking hope and change Obama sticker up or a Bernie Sanders sticker up. Like, it doesn't matter. And it's a political group. Same thing. I mean, they're trying to villainize MAGA hats and stuff like that. Um, but what I think is the most alarming is two things. The um, the new stipulation on, like, the SF-86 is the security clearance process. Because, as you know, yeah. like, if you want to have a good job in the military and the government, you have to be able to hold a security clearance. Right. Like, you can't be a mover and a shaker without getting a security clearance and probably getting a top level one, like a TS. Um, And so they've put this clause in there that basically allows whoever is asking the questions. And sometimes this is at the end of a polygraph and we all know how those things go. Um, Hey, have you ever been part of an extremist group or a group that believes in conspiracies? So whoever's administering the test, they get a good deal of leeway to decide what that individual is thinking or what they consider a terrorist or, or, or sorry, an extremist group that believes in conspiracies, you know? So there's that. And so that, that gatekeeping right there, I think is, is pretty dangerous because we're going to get an intelligence community now for intelligence community and top leaders that are paranoid, you know, to say the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really are doing everything they can to just genuflect with the current regime. And then the installation of the political commissars, that guy, Bishop Garrison, who's, uh, Secretary of Defense Austin is a right-hand man. I mean, that guy's extremely radical. Like, he is a proponent of critical race theory, which is a Marxist ideology. They tried to put that guy, Estrada, down at our old command, down yeah. at Special Operations Command. And that guy, he didn't... And, and I think they're trying to put it right up in our faces. He didn't even clean up his social media. No. I mean, his social media had, like, he's comparing Trump supporters to Hitler. Yeah. You know, so what message does that send? And I, I think the trickle-down message that sends to commanders that want to continue to have a career in the military is like, hey, hey, you need to go find all these guys who crack down on them. Because if I don't see you finding these guys and cracking down on them, you're part of the problem too. I mean, you know the culture of the military. That's kind of how how that's going to go. So that, those are the big, the commissars and then the loyalty tests are the big things that I've seen. Yeah, that's so interesting because uh, most people don't understand how poly, uh, polygraphs even work. So they're, right. the, the polygrapher is the, the decider. So you can, yeah. you can, everything can check out. And I had this experience. So I had this experience. Everything was good. I, I had a TS for 20 years. And the polygrapher didn't believe what I was saying. I passed the poly. Like, he didn't believe it. And I'm like, yeah, it's just fundamentally untrue. I, I mean, it is what it is. So a polygrapher can actually say, no. They can go, yeah, I just don't. I know it checks out. And actually, he's, he passed the box. But I just don't. I'm getting a bad vibe off this guy, you know? Like, and... uh and it's interesting because that was the first time that I knew a polygrapher could go, yeah, he passed. But you know what? One of his eyes twitched and I just got a bad feeling off this dude or whatever. And you're like, yeah, I've been working it for nine years just because I was a fucking asshole because you're asking me the same 
question for fucking three days <laughs> doesn't mean anything. Like, oh my God. Oh, you, you guys, you guys flushed me out. Holy shit. You know, but they have a lot of, uh, you know, adjudications is one of those things that if you put in a, I think a very, um, a non objective and subjective question based on, we'll, we'll say, a general interpretation with a, a specified ideology that we know is accepted. There's no way that shit would fly, have, would have flown anywhere. If we, if, if, if George Bush, I remember this. I don't know if you remember this. Remember when we got Bibles, uh, pushed out to us in the field? We got, like, we got big boxes of Bibles. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were sent out yeah. to us. And I was like, what? We're not like converting Muslims out here. Like, what are we doing? We're not, we, we like, I, I, I so I, I I very much disagreed with this whole thing. Like we got crates of Bibles. I'm like, dude, the government shouldn't be buying Bibles to send over to Iraq. This is a little bit fucking insane. Can you imagine right. if there was some type of subjective loyalty test on an SF-86 that said, "Have you ever been a liberal or or oh, man. Yeah. believed in like you know uh, yeah. or believed in like socialism or dabbled in socialist ideology?" Like, holy shit, man! Like, yeah. half do the State Department would be gone. Yeah, do, do you believe in universal basic income? Terrorist, like yeah. You know? terrorist. Yeah, I, yeah. The big, the big problem, I think, is just like the, the culture of the military. You can't have the, you can't have Joe Biden and you can't have the Secretary, Secretary of Defense saying that, hey. Without any evidence saying, I think that white supremacy, white supremacy and um, white nationalism are the number one terrorist threat. And we're going to have a stand down to go find these people because there, there's no way that subordinate leaders who want to continue to be successful. Most of them, unfortunately, are going to come back and say, hey, sir, you were totally wrong. We don't have any. We found approximately zero because we already have a security clearance process. We have a recruiting process that takes care of most of this anyway. So we don't really have this problem here. Yeah, there's no way because there's no incentive system for those subordinate officers to come back and say that they have to find something. Right. So now there's this, it's basically a witch hunt. And now we've created this system where these polygraph adjudicators, these security clearance adjudicators, or even these commanders are like, hey, I went and I, I found these guys that had Gadsden flags in the team room and I issued some Article 15s, ruined some guys' careers, you know, so forth and so on. Or, you know, I identified this one guy who has libertarian ideology. He's a massive Trump. So he had a huge, he had a MAGA flag on his truck. He went to a Trump rally, you know, just I'm being anecdotal here, but we've created this system where these people that now have been charged with going out and finding this white nationalism, white, white, whatever, uh, terrorism, that they go out and they, they do find it. They keep investigating until they find it. And that's, I think that's just extremely dangerous. Yeah. I, I can't imagine like, I don't know how many dudes that I know have the Gaston flag or something, you know, come and take it because I saw that on the list too. Oh, come yeah. and take it. And I'm like, yeah. you guys, this, this is a piece of American history. This is the founders of the, of the, the writers of our constitution, the founders of our country, like Benjamin Franklin drew the don't tread on me and he published it in yeah. a newspaper. It was about the unification of America, the development. Right. It was, it was the birth of our country. And yeah. when you see these guys, you know, the people that serve our country and like to, to be willing to sacrifice life, limb or eyesight, you have to be pretty patriotic. I know that might be a surprise to everybody. Like, <laughs> and you might take an interest in how the country was formed, like an actual right. historical representation and be proud of all the accomplishments. And the one is, Hey, we, we, we bucked the fucking system, man. We built something yeah. away from the king. We were we were one of uh, a, a lot of other countries that did it after us. But ultimately, hey, man, we built something very special that we should be really fucking proud of and that we should be continuing to evolve. Something that happened 250 years ago doesn't represent exactly what the country is either, right? It's like, okay, we're not adhering to everything. Like, you know, th these... They were still reading with candles. Like that doesn't mean we want to go back and only use candlelight dummies. Like we're not representing that. We're saying Proud. if you're patriotic yeah. and you take an interest in American history, this stuff is cool. These guys were very intellectual. They were, they could see into the future. They, they're, they're, you know, the fathers of a, of the American democracy or representative democracy that we live in today. Like this is just a piece of American history. And 
trust me when I say this, it's like, man, not all the history that we have is something that you, just because you're proud of the country doesn't mean that you're proud of the entire history of the nation, right? Right. Well, I think right. they're misinterpreting that. I think there's a drastic misinterpretation yeah. between being proud of your country and then saying, oh, well, I take ownership in everything it's ever done. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. But I think assaulting the, the, those symbols of our, of our legacy and of the American system, I think going after those and right now saying, well, that's part of this white nationalist ideology. I think that's also deliberate too, because if you want to be able to reset the entire system, you have to do everything that you can to either discredit our old ideology or just completely destroy it. I mean, I, I feel like talking to, I feel like an old guy, because sometimes I feel like talking to some younger people that unless they went and sought it out themselves, they're not getting taught like basic American history or basic civics in, in the public schools, which I think is absolutely insane. But that's obviously part of the effort to erase what actually is America. And they say that we're, you know, white nationalists because they try and say, oh, well, if you support any part of America's history, then you're, then you're blessing off on its entire past, which is, like you said, it's absolute insanity. The best story, the American story is that we're constantly striving for better. Like we, we remember where we came from. We remember all the trials and tribulations that built this country. We also remember our past mistakes. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think there's anyone out there who's apologizing for slavery, but we actually had it. We, the founders wrote in the document that all men are created equally. And it took us a while. We fought an entire war to see that vision to its completion. And I think that's something that we should be proud of. But if you want to destroy the system, you have to go after every single one of those symbols and just be like, nope, they're all racist and they're all horrible. I think that's what's definitely at play. Well, and I think they're losing the actual history. I went back and I wrote, mm -hmm. I read um, uh, Thomas Jefferson's biography, actually a couple of, a couple of them, uh, just recently. So Benjamin Franklin, nice. Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and this was a hotly debated uh topic, by the way. People don't understand that this was yeah. a very hotly debated topic. Um, John Adams asked uh, Thomas Jefferson about slavery specifically multiple times, and he dodged the question. John Adams talks about it in his papers. And what ultimately they, 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 they came to this conclusion was, and they knew it. They're like, eventually we will have to fight a war over this. They knew it. They, they, they said, we will, but we can't fight. We can't grow a country and fight an internal war right now. It just will not happen. Right. We're going to have to punt on this to the future generations to solve this problem. But right now, we can't take on multiple tasks or there won't be a country. I'm obviously <laughs> distilling this. <laughs> no. There's no... Yeah, no but that's they're like, everybody was, right. everybody was on board. Everybody, nobody disagreed. I'm like, that's absolutely inaccurate. They, they all disagreed about shit all the time. The, they all the time, they're debating in these fucking hot rooms in Philadelphia over every fucking issue imaginable for hours. Uh, yeah. And it's, and it's absurdity to think that all these guys did it was just like, ah, yeah, we, you know what? We're just, uh, we're in this for ourselves. We're just going to like, you know, get this thing. <laughs> we all have slaves. Yeah. Hey, this is what it's going to boil down to. It's fucking absurdity. Um, yeah. but the, and I think it's just, you're, ac you're, you're exactly right. It's, it's an inaccurate representation of American history. I'm reading, um, this book right now about, uh, the Nez Perce Indian tribe. It's, it, I think it's called the last war or something like that. It's about the last American Indian war. And, um, and it talks about the history of the, the Nez Perce Indian tribe, which is, is contextual because I grew up in Lewiston, Idaho with the Nez Perce Indian tribe, the Nimipu. And a lot of my friends, you know, they were Native American. I, I've got a, like a lot. Like they, when I came back from Iraq, they threw me a, a, a powwow, like a reception back into the community, just like I was a warrior coming home from their tribe. I mean, that's pretty cool. It's amazing, right? These, these, incredibly supportive, amazing community. And their history was in 1805, they were the first, uh, the first encounter that they had with any white person was Lewis and Clark when they came into the Weeite Prairie. And at night in 1877, so fast forward 72 years later, the cavalry was pursuing them and pursued them for over 1500 miles before they eventually caught up with the tribe uh, just south of the Canadian border. Um, and it, it, it's interesting because I'm starting to hear some of the original deals that were cut back in the day between the United States government and the Nez Perce Indian tribe. And contextually, it's like, 
oh my gosh, man. <laughs> like, like what a, a take a relationship that was absolutely rock solid. These guys were 110% on the, we'll call it the American expansion. Uh, when I say how we can work together to bring people last and, and then we ended up, uh, not we, I don't think we can take collective responsibility, but then that relationship had deteriorated so much that in 72 years, they, they were pursuing them around the Western United States to eventually kill the majority of them to force them onto reservations. And I think about that today. Mike, if somebody was trying to force me and my family onto a reservation or a, or a defined border where it's like, you are going to live here. Boy, I'll tell you, man, like I can't really find a reason why I wouldn't, I wouldn't be fighting because I'd be like, there's no fucking way you're going to put me in there, man. Like, what are you talking about? No way. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, uh, and I think about it only in the context of states. So I was thinking about this in context of states. Uh, I'll get to my point, I promise. It won't be that boring. But uh, right now we have the ability, we can move from Damn. a state that is being... Uh, mismanaged or misrepresents our values into a state that more accurately represents our values. Right now we can do that. And when the Fed gets involved and they start blanket policy making, uh, now there's no escape. You can't move to, you know, Wyoming or, you know, Utah or Texas or one of these other states that more accurately represents your values because the federal government is enforcing national policy, um, which I know has been the debate for a couple hundred years in this country, by the way, states' rights, how much do they have, you know, federal systems. But it, it pushes me into what's happening in your state right now? Like, what are people talking about that they don't feel is the representative government in Washington state and how they're being represented and how that accurately depicts how they feel. What's happening? What are the big issues in Washington state? Yeah. A big one. I mean, big one that's been first and foremost, I think that's affected people's daily lives has been the COVID lockdown. So like the three Western three states on the West coast, like our governors try to out each other all the time. So like, we're still doing COVID <laughs> lockdowns. Like, yeah, I mean, like businesses aren't open. Like even when the, the rest of the country is like, hey, if you do whatever Joe Biden said, if you're vaccinated, you guys can go back out. Like we're still wearing masks in public places. Most, I'd say about 50% of businesses are kind of being a little more common sense with that. But we still have the federal, we still have the state government all up in people's lives, depriving them of their ability to earn a living put their kids in schools and then, you know, go to their places of worship and just freely assemble. So there's part, there's one part of the state that is on board with that. Obviously that's Seattle, a little bit, a little pocket here and there in Olympia, uh, the closer you get to the water, yeah. the rest of the state we're, we're pushing back and people, people want their lives back. Um, and they're really very skeptical. I think a year ago you would have had some more people that were like, okay, I'm on board with the vaccine if it's going to help. But now there's people that are being told, you must have a vaccine to go if you want to go sit in a certain section of a Mariners ball game. Uh, we're going to put vaccine clinics in the high schools to start getting kids vaccinated. Like just real massive amounts of like draconian 1984 style government overreach. So people want the state government the heck out of their lives. So we, we do have, we have this discussion out here all the time. Probably at every event that I go to, people are talking about, hey, I've lived here in this community for you know decades. My family's from here, but I'm leaving. Like, I want to go to Idaho. I want to go to Texas. I want to go to South Dakota. And so there's got, but the discussion, you know, we, we have, and this is kind of my stance on it is like, where are you going to run to next? Yeah. I mean, because we're like, what, what's next? Like, look at what's going on in, in Texas. I mean, Texas is, is, is a great example. Whoever would have thought there'd be so much insanity in some of the major uh, urban hubs in Texas of all places. So I think we, we have to stand up and fight for our, our own values and the way that we want to live our lives, push as much power and authority down to local levels as humanly possible. I think that that's, that's really one of the big things. The other big thing that we have is lawlessness because we're so close to Portland. We're essentially a suburb of Portland. We're just right across the Columbia River for people that aren't familiar. And so we've had a good deal of bleed over. We've had times where Antifa and BLM have come in to Vancouver and acted violently. But by and large, we have a ton of the homeless population, which they're not really homeless. It's just people that are choosing to live this lifestyle. There's some mental health issues there. There's some drug issues there. But overall, it's a law and order vagrancy issue. And these people are used as Antifa's foot soldiers quite frequently. And so we have 
government that is on one hand with the COVID lockdowns depriving us of our ability to go out and live as free Americans. But on the other hand, it's allowing a criminal element to destroy entire cities. And we're not doing anything about it on any level. So there's a, there's, there's a good deal of, of anger out here. So those are, those are some of my bigger issues. There's some economic issues too. Our, for decades, our timber industry has just been gutted. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, there's a massive economic trap too, but those are the, I'd say those are the two big ones that come up really frequently. Yeah. And the timber industry issue is close to home because I, I grew up uh, obviously in a logging family. Uh, both my, both my grandparents, my father, everybody was loggers and, uh, you know, I go home, I see it, you know, it's, it's, there's a mill in my, uh, the, the town I grew up in, there's a paper mill called Potlatch, or I think now it might be renamed, maybe somebody else bought it, but Potlatch, obviously, you know, Boise Cascade, because I think that's bigger in Washington and Potlatch is bigger yeah. in Idaho. Uh, and then you go to my, my original hometown, there's a, there's a sawmill there. And I, I think about this all the time. Uh, because I think about the issue from uh, in the 90s when the North American Free Trade Act, right, and the Canadians were able to import and subsidize lumber prices as far as my understanding of this, which mm -hmm. un essentially undercut the American lumber prices. So we couldn't even afford to buy our own fucking timber because the Canadians were subsidizing their market and it killed the late, it killed the lumber industry. Uh, and we look at this opportunity that we have right now as a nation to become economically independent. And we, especially if anything is proven to us in, in, the, in the last several, several, several months, is that the more independence we have, the, the safer we are as a nation. And I'm not talking isolationist. I'm saying we can right. have economic independence. Lumber prices are what, 30 or 40 percent higher than they were pre-COVID. And sometimes in some places, even more. Uh, it's insane. It's insane. And I'm thinking, yeah. okay, well, why are why is the t the timber industry why is the timber industry being affected, or, or why is it not a hundred percent engaged right now? Like we should be harvesting timber, and oh by the way, we we're we're going to have one of the biggest fire seasons I think in probably modern history right now because of uh, yeah. temperature, yeah, the the lack of snow in the mountains, so. Right now, the timber industry could actually save a good portion of what's going to happen over the next few years with fire. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it doesn't make any sense to me. So what's the counter narrative What in Washington state right now to not fully activating our timber industry? It's the, it's the religion of environmentalism. It's the, it's the low science science. You know, people are just yeah. saying like, well, if we... If we cut down the forest, then there's no middle ground. You're just going to cut them all down at once. And then we're not going to have any trees. And then uh, global warming. Like it's it's really light on details, heavy on rhetoric. And it's been that way since I was growing up, really. I think we started gut gutting out the, the timber industry in the 80s and the 90s. And I think this is the, the case for pretty much any natural resource industry that we have in the United States. I mean, the United States is incredibly blessed. Like timber industry, steel industry, coal we can be energy independent. And I think this is the case throughout the nation. So our timber industry was, was killed off. We have a whole generation of people, um, you know, I'm 41. So I'm either like a really young Gen Xer or like a really old millennial. But from our generation on, essentially, we are told, hey, you can't really participate in industry anymore because those jobs are all dead. That's like yeah. that's like what our grandparents did. That's not here. Here's what you need to do. You need to go to college, get a college degree in anything. It doesn't matter. Follow your doesn't heart. Matter. Take yeah. the student debt. Yep. You know, but if you're really, really smart too, you'll also, you'll go into the tech sector because tech, man, that's the future. So you got to be a computer guy. And so now we have this, these generations that went to college, they took the debt. They have a ton of debt on their shoulders. They had to move away from the small uh, town that had the sawmill in it where their parents worked, their grandparents worked, that provided a living for them, moved away, moved to the big city, took on the debt. They get there, saddled with all this debt, and there's hardly any jobs because all of our jobs got shipped overseas with manufacturing. The tech industry largely went over there as well. But then the tech jobs that were here, you have legal immigration. That's really gutted a lot of our high-end um, jobs here in the Pacific Northwest because there's there's a good tech sector here. But we have this H-1B visa system that brings in cheaper workers from, you know, by and large, India, but overseas. And they can pay them at a fraction of the cost of what they pay Americans. So now you have this whole multiple you know, generations at this point from Gen X on that have college debt, they have no actual job skills that they can actually get a good job that can provide for a family with. So now they're in the gig economy. 
you know, working from job to job. If they can get, if, if they do get married, it's really hard for them to start having kids because they can't buy a house. What are you going to do with the kids? Because daycare costs so much. It essentially costs, you know, takes two incomes to hold up a household. So we, we've got this whole generation that we've just sold this whole false bill of goods. And so to me, because of the threat that our debt and our lack of production poses, especially when it comes to China, because we rely on China to buy for debt bonds, I think we have to get our country on a wartime footing to bring back manufacturing. So we offer up the industries that have shipped their jobs overseas. We offer them a grace period where they can get some sort of a tax incentive for coming back. But then after that, we tear the heck out of them and we get back into making America independent um, with the resources that we can harvest from our land to provide for for our people and for the for you know the better better future so that a person can graduate high school, they can get a good job in an industry and they can start a family. I think just when the government needs to start working more towards that American dream. So that's that's the counter narrative that and really just getting the government the heck out of people's lives with the COVID lockdowns and enforcing law and order. And those are, those are huge issues. You know, I, I was thinking about uh, the timber industry specifically. I've been thinking about it a lot in the last uh, last couple of weeks because of uh, my dad is a logger. Obviously, we just talked about that. But I've been thinking about that. And I think it's extremely hypocritical as a nation for us to say that it's it's acceptable for us to import the lumber that we need from other countries. But oh, yeah. our trees are special. We get, we just get to look at those. We, we, our trees are special. We, yeah. we can't touch those because those are for us to look at, but we can import yeah. the trees from Canada because those are not the trees that we have to look at. The Canadians have to deal with that shit. Like versus finding, you know, environmentally sustainable farming practices. Oh, by the way, they've already done a ton of that. So, you know, using peanut oil and your hydraulic fluid versus like standard petroleum products and, you know, selective harvesting and a bunch of these other things. Because people think that logging still is the same type of logging they were doing in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And I, I'm, I'm here to tell you that it's not. Uh, there's very limited, uh, I would say, non-environmentally practiced uh, logging because people have been able to find a balance between protecting the streams and forests for the things that we want to go out and hunt because most of those loggers are also hunters and fishermen, by the way. So they have zero interest in harvesting themselves out of a recreational activity, by the way. They don't fucking yeah. do it. Uh, so I think there's a, this counter point that I'm trying to make in that is like, man, it's so fucking hypocritical. Like, why, why would we not just increase our output for the demand, go to ourselves first for that demand, create the jobs, make sure they're they're sustainable for future jobs. Because, oh, by the way, you also want your kids, if it's a family business, you also want your kids and right. kids to have a fucking, to have a, to have a business. It's counterproductive right. to work yourself out of a job. Um, yeah. And so I, 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 yeah. think, I, anyway, I think that's, this is my, stupid musings for the day no I, I trust the uh the logging families that have provided for generations i trust them more to maintain the forests than i trust the federal government who's <laughs> just gonna be like no you can't you can't touch the forest those are our forests maybe i'll let you go hiking through there every now and again and take some pictures and you'll have to pay me you know a fee to go into the forest yeah. but i you know but we're gonna let the forest go to such a state that there's so much undergrowth here there's no fire breaks there's no logging roads that when one fire gets out of control it spreads and engulfs the entire region like we've seen like the last two summers here like we had to thank god it didn't get too close to our house we evacuated last summer um because it was too close for my my comfort level um and that's all that's all preventable i mean we're gonna have wildfires that happens i think that happened before you know we were even we were even sure. here yep. but i mean the amount of uh selective uh controlled harvesting and actually going in and getting rid of a lot of the underbrush and then logging roads man those are big fire breaks and they also allow fire crews to get out to fire sites quickly like these are these are things i think that, that just get excluded from the conversation but are very important and it's just ridiculous for us to sit here when we're blessed with so many different resources and put our people into economic peril and put our country in a precarious situation where we don't produce anything and, and just allow that all to happen. To me, it's just, it's, it, it's absolutely like negligent and unacceptable. Same thing with the oil industry. I mean, we just shut down we're, we are making it, we are making every American right now pay out exorbitant amount of fees just at the pump at the grocery store because everything costs more because we went, because Joe Biden went in on day one and killed off the colonial pipeline. Like, 
how much of an egomaniac do you have to be to think that that's a good idea? Like you're just going to kill off those 10,000 jobs and be like, well, you know, I have this idea about the Green New Deal. And so everybody should just suffer along with me. Like it's, it's an insane amount of hubris. That's it. You're exactly right. It's an insane amount of hubris. And, you know, that the, the Green New Deal is is so theoretical and aspirational in the context of uh, yeah. where are you going to fund it? Like, how are you going to fund yep. it? it we, we can't print enough money to actually fund this thing. I mean, the, the what what I was telling somebody was like this. It sounds so um, uh, it, it, it's it's so hyperbolic. Right. And it's so theoretical if we actually started to implement this, the the currency of our, con- our of our country would be so devalued because we'd be investing. And I'm not against investing in infrastructure in the company whatsoever, or the country whatsoever. Yeah. And there is a limit to the rational input that we can make as a country and the expectation of the taxpayer to do that across the United States. Um, without it having a balance to inflation. When we're seeing inflation right now for the, I think the, the, the first time uh, in at least my modern life that we've seen inflation numbers like this over the course of the last 18 months. Uh, and when you look at what's happening, I mean, Amazon just bought what, something like 40% of the, na- like the nation's steel. Did you read that? Did, did you read that article about how they're buying up steel? And yeah. So we should be crazy. Yeah, it's 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 fucking crazy, and and there's a reason why. Like you know, there's a reason why Amazon has been successful, and there's a reason why they're doing that. There's a reason why um, I think uh, and everything doesn't necessarily have to have a reason, but there is a reason why. You know, is it Oregon that the uh, there's a there's like half of Oregon that wants to secede and become Idaho? Is that right? But yeah, Greater Idaho. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty much everywhere, like just just south of Portland, and it kind of goes over. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. They, they want a hard divorce from Portland. Yeah. Man, I'll tell you, I want a hard divorce from Portland, and I don't live anywhere fucking near that place. That place is whole country nuts. Mind, right? Yeah. It's like that place is fucking yeah. nuts. Have you seen that? Failed, it's a failed state. <laughs> it really is. Like it's like it's a failed fucking state. That's a really good way to actually uh, explain that. Have you seen that in Washington too? Or guys talking about like, hey, we want to secede and go over to Idaho. Oh yeah, for sure. Really? Yeah. The, so the eastern, the eastern part of the state, it's the same um, politics, really. Like if you right. get east of the Cascades, unfortunately, in Oregon and Washington, way more conservative, and they want to break away from Portland and Seattle. My district's unique because we're. We're very red. We're very conservative, but we're we're right in the thick of it. We're just you know ten miles north of Portland, um, and then we actually touch the Pacific Ocean. We're one of two districts that's red that actually touches the Pacific Ocean. So wow. we're trying to hold down as the last bastion of of conservative values um, on on the West Coast, really. And uh, so, exactly, your how many people do you have in your district? Do you know, uh, we are. As far as voters go, yeah. we're just shy of a million, so we're like eight hundred thousand. Okay. Oh wow, that's big. Yeah. And then, what, what's yeah. the split between uh, D and R in there? Is it like forty, sixty? So, yeah, we're pretty solid. We're R plus five still. Okay. So, right. the, the incumbent that I'm going to primary, she's been um, sitting representative for this. When we actually go have the election, this will be her twelfth year that she's been she's been power. Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. So Trump did really well in 2020 and in 2016. And then we have a pretty interesting, um, I'd say, like libertarian populist um, streak out here because the district in the primaries in 16 and 20 both went for Bernie. They didn't go for Hillary or for Biden. And then in 2012, everybody went. Uh, the Republicans didn't go for Romney. They went for uh, Ron Paul. So Whoa, it's an okay. interesting populist libertarian uh, dynamic out here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I, I, I like that. I, I actually that's that's surprising. yeah. It's actually pretty. It's actually pretty cool. I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna get some good crossover votes um, from people that are just sick of both parties yeah. with the, the national populist message, kind of making government work for the people again. Because I think that's something that like the populist left and the populist right and libertarians can all kind of actually agree on and have really interesting, productive conversations. So are you? Um... So what what does the election look like as far as timing is concerned? So when do people go to the booth and things like that? So we have uh, we have a funny system. We have a very late primary. So August of 22 is when okay. our primary is. 
and we have a general primary, so we don't do. I'm I'm challenging an incumbent from the Republican Party, but we don't do a partisan primary. It's everybody goes into one primary, and the top two take all. Oh, wow. So whoever the top two vote getters are, they move into the general. Yeah, so it's uh it's pretty interesting. Uh, how big's your team out there? It's pretty big. So we just signed on our 200th volunteer. Um, I hired a general campaign manager a little while ago. Um, but yeah, so it, we're, we're light on the paid staff and we're heavy on the volunteers. So that's great. Yeah. I, you were on, uh, Tim pool, what two weeks ago, week and a half ago. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right after, um, well, then. Yeah, how'd you yeah. guys get linked? Up? World, actually. How'd you guys get linked up? Uh, so my general, my general consultant's a guy named Matt Brainerd. He did ran the election integrity projects, part of Trump's team. He's been on Tim pool a whole bunch. So he got me, got me on there. That's cool. How long, how long did you have on that show? I only watched like the first uh, 20 minutes. So how long were you on there? You know, I thought it was like shorter, but then I looked at it and it was like two hours. So we were, we, we talked for about two hours. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it, was, it was fun, man. It was a blast. Yeah. Cause he, he seems like, a, I, I've listened to his show for quite a while. I, you know, I, I think I got turned on to him through Rogan. I was listening to a Rogan show. And yeah. Got turned on to him. And uh, so I'll listen to, I'll turn in in and out, right? So it depends on who's who's on or what he's talking about. I'll I'll get in yeah. there and, and listen. But where's he where's he based out of? He's like out in the middle of the sticks, like Virginia, like that Virginia, uh, Maryland, West Virginia. Yeah, yeah. Where that all kind of comes in. He's he's like out there. He's yeah. Out there. He's got he's got his own little compound. He fled the city too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. Like he's building like a skate park in ter- like inside his house or whatever, like a skate. He does. He has he has a full skate like Biggest basement I've ever seen in my life is his basement. Like, he's got a whole, it's a full on skate park and then like podcast studio. But like, it, it's really cool. That's fucking rad, man. Uh, where can everybody yeah. find uh, Joe Kent? So if you want to go, you know, subscribe or donate or all that kind of cool stuff, where can they find you? Yeah, the easiest way is joekentforcongress.com. I got a, different tabs on there. One's got all my stances on a bunch of different issues. So you can read about that. You can send me an email directly. Link tree to all our social media. And if people can, they feel like it, they can give me a donation. There's a donation tab on there. Um, I put up over $200,000 of my own money um, into this, mostly because I feel really weird asking people for money, not being a politician. Um, so I wanted to kind of put my money where my mouth is. Um, so any kind of small donation people can give, five, 10, 15 bucks, really helps me go and take the fight to DC. Well, Joe, it's been awesome, man. I hope to have you back, especially before uh, the primary. Just check in and tell you, tell me how things are going. Uh, can't thank you enough for, for taking the time, uh, everything you've done for this country. It definitely doesn't go unrecognized, especially from, uh, from the black rifle perspective. I appreciate everything you've done and continue to do, man. Well, thanks, man. I really appreciate, uh, the opportunity to come on the show and I appreciate everything you're doing, man, behind the scenes for, uh, for veterans. And then just kind of, kind of given our community a voice. I think it's awesome. It's least I can do brother. All right, man. See ya.